Hey co-stars, welcome to another Generation Films video. My name is British Ben, the best Ben. And today, as promised, we will be looking at the 10 advantages of Starfleet, the fictional space navy of the United Federation of Planets. They were just a bunch of amateur dramatics enthusiasts set on exploring space. In faith, I do not love thee with mine eyes, for they in thee a thousand errors see, but tis my heart that loves what they despise, who, in despite of view, art pleased to dote. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? But first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Swagbucks for sponsoring this video. Look, it's winter, it's cold outside. What if I told you there was a way for you to make and save money from the comfort and warmth of your own home? Well, that's exactly the service that Swagbucks offers. You can earn cash by taking surveys, watching videos and playing games, you know, mostly stuff that you're already doing anyway. I gave Swagbucks a try and was able to get gift cards and discounts for some of my favorite stores and websites like Starbucks, Amazon, Walmart, AMC Theatres, Hotels.com and more. You can try it out yourself by clicking the link in the description below and signing up for free. And if you act on it now, you get $5 just for signing up. Making money doesn't get any easier than that. So thanks again to Swagbucks for supporting this video. Now let's get back to Starfleet. Number one, Starship design. For a long period of time, Starfleet didn't build warships, but after their horrifying defeat at the Battle of Wolf 359, they were forced to rethink their strategy, and eventually when they did reluctantly decide to build some dedicated battleships, they produced some really incredible vessels. The USS Defiant is a great example of this. The vessel was more compact than other Starfleet ships and was equipped with pulse phaser cannons, photon and quantum torpedo launchers, and ablative armor which would protect the ship when shields failed. When weapons fire hit the armored hull, the armor would burn off at a controlled rate, diffusing the energy of the blast. This controlled boil-off would create a particle cloud that would diffuse weapons fire, kind of like a 24th century version of chaff that's used by fighter jets to evade guided missiles. Then there was the Enterprise E, a redesigned version of the Enterprise D, but with much heavier armament, suited for more tactical roles such as fighting the Borg. The Enterprise E was also able to punch above its weight in its battle with the Scimitar, a ship with 52 pulse disruptor cannons and 27 photon torpedo launchers. Even if they did use some unconventional tactics. Put simply, when they finally got their act together, Starfleet's vessels outclassed those of its rivals. Number two, the ability to amass large fleets for battle. Starfleet wasn't as big as other space navies. Like we said in our previous video, their reluctance to use slave labor limited their industrial capacity, but they were able to amass large fleets for battle. At Wolf 359, they faced the Borg with 40 ships. At the Battle of Sector 001, a similar number. But in the Dominion War, Starfleet really pulled its resources together and amassed a fleet of 627 ships to take on the Dominion and the Cardassians in Operation Return, the effort to retake Deep Space Nine and control of the Bajoran wormhole. You see multiple Galaxy-class ships fighting together and other older-style vessels. So even at this time when they hadn't yet built a lot of dedicated battleships, they still packed a punch. Number three, soft power. Starfleet served the United Federation of Planets, and from the start, the Federation were diplomats. The Federation was an alliance formed in 2161 between humans, Vulcans, Andorians, and Tellarites. To be honest, I could cope with the two on the right, but that one on the left, I don't think I'd even want to be in the same room as that. I'm speciesist, I know. Anyway, the Federation didn't rely on military conquest to expand, like the Klingons did. Instead, they relied on diplomacy, peacefully recruiting member worlds. By the latter half of the 24th century, the Federation had over 150 member planets. So, kind of like the European Union, which has just peacefully expanded by recruiting new members ever since its creation, with one exception. Let's not go there. 
And it isn't just member worlds that the Federation would use its diplomacy on. They were also very eager to negotiate with enemies. They ended their war with the Klingons with a treaty known as the Kittimer Accords and maintained peace with the Romulan Star Empire with another treaty known as the Treaty of Aldron, which set out the neutral zone between Federation and Romulan space. They were even open to fighting alongside their traditional enemies in order to defeat threats from elsewhere in the galaxy. Both the Romulans and Klingons fought alongside Starfleet ships in the war with the Dominion, and the Enterprise E also fought alongside two Romulan ships to defeat the Scimitar, which was under the command of the illegitimate Romulan leader Shinzon. Number 4. Intelligence and Ingenuity Humans are smart and possess a unique way of looking at problems compared to other alien races, some of which are very predictable. Vulcans always use logic, for example. This is one reason why the Borg were so eager to assimilate Earth, the unique human characteristics. You are not Borg. That's right. And I hope to stay that way. You will be assimilated. Humans were often able to think on their feet and come up with ingenious solutions to problems, outwitting their enemies. Like the time the crew of Voyager were able to modify Borg nanoprobes to create a weapon that could take on the seemingly invincible Species 8472, which even the Borg couldn't defeat. Or how Janeway ultimately defeated the Borg when she infected them with a computer virus after being assimilated. Number 5. Incredible Adaptability Humans are adaptable. A largely human crew was able to man and operate the former Cardassian space station Terrap Nor, which they renamed Deep Space Nine. The Voyager crew were able to adapt to life 70,000 light years away from Federation space in the Delta Quadrant, whilst maintaining Starfleet protocol and even use Borg technology to modify their ship. They built an astrometrics lab, enhanced the sensors, and hooked up a Borg transwarp coil to their warp drive system, which took 15 years off their trip home. Number six, they had the ability to time travel. So when all other options fail, why not just time travel and solve the problem before it happens? So Starfleet were able to time travel, but they didn't use it all the time. They reserved it for when they were really screwed. Like the time an alien probe that only spoke whale language started destroying the Earth and they decided to go back in time in a stolen Klingon bird of prey to collect some whales to communicate with it. Then there was that time when the Enterprise E followed the Borg back in time to foil their assassination attempt of Zephram Cochran, pig trainer and the inventor of warp drive. And it seems that Starfleet took damage to the timeline very seriously. By the 29th century, they would have dedicated timeships like the Starfleet timeship Relativity, which specialized in policing illegal time travel and repairing damage that illicit time travelers did to the timeline. And she interacted with her past self in front of 15 crew members at a ping pong tournament approximately six minutes ago. Your time frame, of course. Of course. Needless to say, we need to clean up the timeline. Number seven, the ability to rise from the ashes. When Starfleet lost control of Deep Space Nine and were pushed back into the inner area of Federation territory by the Dominion, they were really close to being completely annihilated. And if Dominion reinforcements had come through the wormhole, they would have been toast. But Benjamin Sisko persuaded the Admiralty to allow one last battle with everything they had available in order to retake Deep Space Nine and stop the Dominion reinforcements from coming through the wormhole. And they were successful thanks to the Klingons joining the battle at the final hour and they were able to stop the Federation from being completely eliminated. Number 8. They were incredible at hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yes, Starfleet personnel always seem to have the upper hand against aliens, even when they're fighting in slow motion. Well, maybe that was a special case, but we do often see Starfleet officers beating the hell out of Klingons, who were supposed to be a warrior race far more formidable than pathetic humans. Yet the Klingons lose every time, even to smaller female members of the crew like Major Kira. Major Kira may have been in the Bajoran militia, but she was no Ronda Rousey. 
How much time? Three seconds. Oh. Maybe it's that powerful backhand that everyone in Star Trek seems to use. The only exception is Worf, who just always seems to get beaten up. And he's a Klingon, after all, so it makes sense. I guess they were just a bunch of pussies. Anyway, number nine, they weren't afraid to sacrifice. We often see Star Trek officers sacrifice themselves for the good of the Federation or even the good of other innocent alien races. This ranges from risking their careers, like when the Enterprise E crew disobeyed a direct order so they can go assist Starfleet to defend the Earth from the Borg, or like when Kirk went to work on the deflector relays in order to break the Enterprise B free from an energy ribbon, saving the entire crew and refugees who were on board, but dying himself in the process. I think this attitude of Starfleet officers is summed up in the words of Spock. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And that takes us nicely into our 10th and final advantage of Starfleet. Number 10, they had the moral high ground. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. Not that kind of high ground. The Federation was very strong on human rights. Starfleet officers couldn't just go and rape and pillage lesser developed civilizations. In fact, the Prime Directive forbade them from even revealing themselves to pre-warp societies. Citizens of the Federation also enjoyed, in general, excellent human rights. Even non-biological species, such as androids, were given these freedoms. It is the ruling of this court that Lieutenant Commander Data has the freedom to choose. Yep, Data was pro-choice, he had an abortion. No, I'm just kidding, I support the unborn. But there was no one more passionate about human rights and freedom of speech than Picard. Check this out. The first time any man's freedom is trodden on, we're all damaged. And I think that's where I'm going to end the video today. Don't forget to vote in our poll about how awesome or bad Starfleet is, with five being awesome and one being sucks, okay? I know I completely messed up the poll last time, so please do it this time and we'll get it right. Once again, thanks to Swagbucks for sponsoring this video. Don't forget you can check out their site by clicking the link below. Please subscribe to Generation Films, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.